This morning, Nathan will be preaching from 2 Corinthians. Let's pray a prayer for illumination before we read God's word. Jesus, you are holy, good, compassionate, kind. Would you quiet the distractions in our midst and in our minds as we hear your word read and preached? Feed us with your truth this morning and be with Nathan as he preaches it. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your teaching and encourage us in our belief and in our faith. We love you, Jesus. Amen. This is the word of God from the book 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who, had, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnment on the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remained unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Hey, what does it mean to be a great leader? <laughs> Have you thought about that in a while? And does it make a difference? Does, does society care whether we have great leaders or not? Does it matter? What's it like to follow a great leader? I'm certainly not a leadership theory expert, <laughs> but these are some of the things I think about You know, when I'm taking a long shower or can't sleep at night, things like that. You don't? Okay, cool. Well, I do sometimes. I think in a real sense, if you're like me, which I hope you're not, but if you're like me, we've all been impacted by leaders, right? Like they're, in all of our lives, we have that coach, that teacher. You know, when we look back through the corridors of our, of our lives, we've, we've had that coach, that teacher, that parent, that friend, that boss, who really, really saw something in us and cultivated it and made us better for it. I mean, you're probably thinking of that person, that individual right now. But then we've also had leaders in our lives that have had more of a negative impact. Maybe a boss, a teacher, a coach, a friend, a parent. 
But nevertheless, all of us have impacted both negative, we have been impacted both negatively and positively by leaders. And so what I want us to wrestle with today, because I think Paul is calling us to wrestle with, both through his modeling and also what he's going to say is, what is actually a great leader? Well, Todd, Todd, Todd Bolsinger, who I think is one of the most leading experts on the topic, He says in, in, in a book called Canoeing the Mountains, which is a, it's, a, it's an artsy title, but it's a wonderful book on leadership. He says leadership, and therefore leaders, are essential. He says leadership doesn't mean title or authority. Leadership is not measured by corner offices with heavy furniture, higher salaries, or, ro- or robust job descriptions. To be authorized or to have a title does not equate to leadership. Leadership is a way of being in an organization, a family, a team, a company, a church, a business, a nation, or any system that mobilizes people to tackle tough challenges and to thrive. Therefore, leadership is always about personal and corporate transformation. But because we're hardwired to resist change, Every living system requires someone in it to live into and lead the transformation necessary to take us into the future that we are resisting. And then he ends with this. He says, the person who takes personal responsibility to live into the new future in a transformative way, in relationship to the others in the system, that is the leader. Leaders don't have to tell you that they're the ones in charge. I always smile inside when I hear someone saying, follow me because I'm the leader. I'm like, well, if you have to say it, you're probably not the leader. But nevertheless, in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 18, Paul's leadership and his authority is being challenged by the Corinthian church. This is what they're saying, and and it's met with skepticism, maybe a healthy dose of skepticism, but they're asking him, hey, what makes you a leader that we should trust? Where's your resume? Prove yourself to us, Paul. And the way that he responds reveals the heart of what I'm going to say, or what I'm interpreting as a great leader. The way in which he responds shows what a great leader is. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and Trust me, this is not, this will, I promise you, this is not an expose in leadership theory or anything like that, okay? This is, because again, I am not an expert in leadership. I am growing and maturing by the help of wonderful congregations and communities in my life all around me. And so I am on this process of learning and growing. And, but, but, and here's the thing, like, I think, well, let me just say it like this. You're right. Paul is an apostle, right? He speak, and he is specific, speaking specifically about his leadership role as an apostle in the early church. However, here's one thing I want us to consider. All leadership, all leadership in every single sphere of life differs by degree, but not by kind. So whether you are responsible for leading a party of one, or a party of one million, whether you're in an ecclesiastical religious setting or in your, what we may refer to as a secular setting, leadership is leadership is leadership. Leadership, great leadership, differs by degree but not by kind. And so therefore, it behooves us to know what a great leader is because at some capacity, we have to face the music. At some capacity, you and I are called to lead. Again, the capacity will be different. But God is calling us to lead other people. And so we need to know what great leadership is, lest we wreck ourselves by not checking ourselves. I said it out of order, but it's still funny, okay? No? So, and not only that, here's the last little caveat. At the same time, all of us, while I think we are leaders in one sense, we also are followers. And we need to know, what is God's standard for leaders in our life? We need to know that. And so based on that, I want us to really unpack this one big question, and that's this. What makes a great leader? What makes a great leader? Would you pray with me? Let's ask God to help us. Lord, you are our only teacher. And so, Father, would you be gracious with us this morning? 
And Father, would you encourage both our hearts and our imagination of the possibilities of the wonder that can be had by us when we trust you and when we act according to the standards in which you have given us incredibly clear through your word. Father, the world needs great leaders, men and women who rise to the occasion, who trust you and participate in what you're doing in the world. Father, be gracious with us. Challenge us where we need to be challenged. Encourage us where we need to be challenged. Encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And Father, at the end of the day, would Jesus be more beautiful to us than anything else in our life? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think one of the first things Paul's going to say in regards to a great leader is this, that great leaders prioritize the people that they're leading. Now, I say that almost as, when you hear that, and when I say it and hear it, my first thought really is, well, duh, right? But really, is it a well, duh? Like, leaders must prioritize the people that they're leading. Or another way we could say it is that leaders, great leaders, are people-focused. They're focused on people. But one of the most beautiful parts of the opening of this chapter is when Paul is challenged in verse 1 for his resume. Hey, bring your resume. Where's your letter of recommendation? Why should we listen to you? Do you notice his response in verse 2? He says, you are my letter of recommendation. Let's just read it. Look at verse 2. You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known by all. Like, great leaders... What Paul is both voicing and modeling for us is that great leaders measure their success based on the flourishing of the people they're leading. Not their own credentials, not where they went to school, not how how many seminars they've taught, not how well they publicly speak. Paul is saying, if you look at my resume, the most important thing about me that you need to know is that your photo's at the top of that bad boy. My existence and justification of a, as a leader is not in what I can do, but how I can, be, how I can serve you and you become the best, most possible version of yourself. That's what it means to prioritize people. These, this church, Paul is saying, you are my letter of recommendation. You are my greatest achievement. Your photo is plastered at the top of my greatest accomplishments. And again, it seems so obvious, but I don't know how obvious it is. But the fact is this, the great leaders prioritize people as their absolute highest commodity. Now, that's not to say leaders don't need to be educated. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying they don't need to have, you know, a a resume or a, a good job history performance. I'm not saying those things. And even Paul himself, remember in Philippians 3? When he's justifying himself to the Philippians to some degree, some Pharisee, a Pharisee, he gives a, blog, he gives a chapter resume. So it's not that leaders don't have resume, but the priority of the leader is not their own accomplishments. It's in your accomplishments. In 1995, I watched a movie that changed my life forever, and I didn't think it was going to, because spoiler alert, like, I'm not, I like like sci-fi and like superheroes and you know, stuff like that. When I heard the title, Mr. Holland's Opus, I thought, oh my gosh. But somehow my grandmother, you know, God rest her soul, tricked me into watching this thing. <laughs> Mr. Holland's Opus changed my life. Absolutely, hands down. I don't know how long it is, but it's one of the greatest movies of all time. And if you've never heard of it, let me summarize it for you. Anyway, who has seen Mr. Holland's Opus? Oh, pfft, beautiful. Let me summarize it for you poor, unfortunate souls that haven't had the chance to watch this thing. Mr. Holland is a very, very, very gifted symphonic practitioner and, com- and conductor. So he, he's young, and he is very zealous for the music and the arts, and so his life goal is to write this single transcendent piece by which will be played in concert halls throughout the world. And he has the talent to do it. The problem is he doesn't have the funding to do it. So he, like most young graduates, gets a, what he thinks is a temporary job at a high school. And then in a wonderful 90s mo- montage you know, of, of, of sorts, he begins to shift his priorities very subtly. He spends less time working on his great symposium that he wants to play, or this nice opus that was going to change the world, and he spends more time investing in his students. 
And what was supposed to be a temporary endeavor winds up being a lifelong career. Decades after he starts, he has a massive, they throw a massive retirement party for him. And all of, there, there are generations of his students come back to celebrate him. And it's this wonderful, wonderful scene. And in particular, there's one fictitious character who stands up, and she's now the governor. And she gets up and she makes this, she says a couple words about Mr. Holland. And here's what she says. She says, Mr. Holland had a profound influence on my life, on a lot of lives I know, and yet I get the feeling that he considers a great part of his own life misspent. Rumor had it that he was always working on this symphony of his, and this was going to make him rich and famous, and probably both. But Mr. Holland isn't rich. He isn't famous. Well, outside of our little town. So it might be easy for him to think of himself as a failure. And he would be very wrong for doing so. Because I think he achieved success far beyond riches and fame. Look around you. There's not a life in this room that you have not touched. And each of us is a better person because of you. And then she says it. You. Excuse me. We. We are your symphony, Mr. Holland. We are the melodies and the notes of your opus. And we are the music of your life. It's a wonderful speech, beautifully written, very powerful scene. But it doesn't work unless Mr. Holland doesn't Um, It doesn't work unless he prioritizes them over himself. That doesn't mean that leaders don't need to self-care and take care of themselves. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is is that great leaders are absolutely people-focused. They know the people that that are following them, and they care deeply about them, seemingly more than their own credentials or even their own abilities at times. So the call for us as leaders, and again, whatever capacity you're leading, is for us to know the people and care about the people that God has given us to lead. And this happens both on a micro level and also on a macro level. On a macro level, you need to know whether you're leading a small group or your family or a Fortune 500 company, you need to know to some degree the personality of the group that you're leading. What are their fears? What are their values? What are their dreams? What are their skills, their strengths? But then also on a micro level, we need to know people. We need to know on an individual basis, like what is the, what makes this person tick so that I can serve them well? Because great leaders, friends, prioritize people. They're people focused in every sense of the word, but that's not all great leaders are. Great leaders are also devoted to creating or cultivating habits of humility. Great leaders cultivate habits of humility. In verse 4, Paul says, such is the, such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Verse 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything, as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God Paul chooses to operate as a leader from a, from a disposition of absolute humility. Again, he's a talented individual. There are other leaders who are not acting this way, but this is the path that Paul chooses. And in the context of this particular statement that he makes, there are others, there are others involved. Well, Paul is not taking, Paul's looking at the Corinthian church and taking no ultimate credit for any achievements that they've accomplished. The only thing he's taking credit for is being the conduit by which God has served and loved these people and brought them to a place to where now they're participating in what God is doing around them. And he does this really in two ways. One, notice the pronouns that he uses. They're collective. They're plural. Like, we are, it's not that we are sufficient, right? He's including other human leaders involved. It's not just Paul saying, hey, I'm the best of all time and I'm accomplishing all these things. 
So from a human perspective, he's not even taking, he's not, he's not owning it himself. He's saying there's a team, there's a part, other individuals involved in this. And then second, he gives all the credit where it belongs to the spirit of God himself who wills and works inside people differently and at different times and uses humans to cultivate those things. He gives God all of the credit because he knows in and of himself he is not sufficient to do so. Where does Paul even get this idea from? Well, it flows up from his theology. And we won't go into all of it right here, but here and then, and then in verses 7 and 9 later, he's going to start intertwining this theological argument inside his justification or explanation for what a great leader is. And one of the things that he's going to mention is that before Christ comes, God primarily reveals his plans and his purposes through the old covenant or through the law that Moses gave. And there was a purpose for that. And the purpose was to reveal God's standard. The second was to point us to the Messiah, our need for a Savior. And the third was to create a rule of faith and life. And there are some that have come to the Corinthian church and they're saying, actually, those things do another thing when you obey them perfectly. They grant you salvation. They grant you freedom. They grant you the flourishing you're looking for. And Paul's saying, absolutely not. There's no one, you're not sufficient enough in yourself to even accomplish that, number one. And number two, that was never the design or purpose of the law. It's only in God and his sufficiency that we can operate the way that he's intended and designed us to operate. He takes this humble disposition when he didn't have to. Humility is a hard thing, and we could spend lots and lots of time talking about humility. You know what that means, P.S., when a preacher says, oh, we could spend lots and lots of time? It means that, one, I'm not prepared to talk about it any more than I already have. (laughs) It's a trick of the trade. What is humility? Very briefly, I love how C.S. Lewis defines it. I think it's helpful. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Recently, Thomas Merton has been challenging me in lots of ways, especially on on the area of humility. He says this, humility is not pretending to be less than you are. Humility is submission to one's utter dependence on God to be who you are called to be, and so, watch this, and so it takes an incredible, heroic humility to be yourself. Humility is being exactly who God has made you to be, now notice, I'm not using a postmodern be who you, rediscover yourself, create yourself as, as you want. No, 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 I'm saying there's a paradigm. God has created you to be a certain way, and you being humble is you acknowledging that and living that out in real life versus being someone that you have created yourself or being someone that you think you should be. No, no, no. There is nothing more beautiful than the way God has made you, and he wants you desperately to operate from that. And being humble is saying, I'm gonna do that. I'm going to trust you. Listen, as I said before, I'll say just briefly, this doesn't mean that you ignore self-care as a leader, just, just being humble. Humble is not weakness. That's why I love Merton's definition. It takes a lot of courage to be humble. It's a position of strength, not a position of weakness. And guess what, friends? All great leaders strive to create habits of humility. We ought to raise an eyebrow if there's not a stench of humility around the leader in whom we're following. Leaders prioritize people. They cultivate habits of humility. And lastly, they have incredibly deep convictions. Incredibly deep convictions. Now, verses 12 through 18, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Meg, Meg read it for us already. And I know the child care people are ready for ready. So let me mention this, like, let me, let, me, let, me, let me roll through the whole thing like this, okay? Paul, well, first of all, great leaders, they have deep convictions. Paul's leadership convictions are absolutely 100% motivated by how God has led him. Paul's convictions come from the way in which God has led him, specifically how Christ has led him. So if we had to really boil this whole thing down into, into one sentence, a great leader is someone who is people-focused and absolutely Christ-centered. Christ-centered, people-focused. Since the beginning of time, and here's where Paul's convictions are coming out, driving this whole thing. And here's what motivates someone to even pursue being, uh, keeping people as the priority and, and pursuing 
pursuing habits of humility? What, even, what motivates that? Because, I mean, we can try hard to do those things, and good luck. It may work for an hour or two, or maybe a week, or if you're really, you know, stubborn like me, maybe a year or so. But eventually it breaks down. So if those components are what makes a great leader, how do we, how do we keep that sustained? And Paul says it's through convictions, specifically these gospel convictions. See, since the beginning of time, God has been the primary leader of the cosmos. The whole world, the whole universe, and all the multiverses, and also of you and I. He is the ultimate leader. He is the apex leader. But the first humans decided his leadership wasn't good enough, and they wanted to go a different route. And when they did, they ushered in two things that didn't exist before, sin and death in human existence. So then at the right time, God raises up Moses. This is what Paul's going to tell us here in these verses. He raises up Moses to consecrate a people for himself. Led by God again. So as Moses is leading them, as God is leading them, the people still are unfaithful to God's covenant. They're not faithful to him. They're not faithful to his rule over them. And thus their hearts remain hardened again. And they remain enslaved to their own sin. Even Moses, as he reveals the glory of the Lord over and over again, the people say, no, thank you. And so therefore, as it was, there's a veil covering their own hearts, separating them from the presence of God. But what Paul is telling us here is that's not the end of the story. In fact, thousands of years after Moses, another greater Moses is going to appear. And his name is Jesus. And it's through Jesus that the veil over God's people is fully lifted and that we're able to be restored to God under his leadership in this flourishing capacity where we experience freedom from sin and guilt and freedom to participate in what God's doing in the world around us. And the question is, how does Jesus accomplish this? Well, Jesus, as the greater Moses, enters our world as the leader of this new covenant that Paul is talking about. And the new covenant is a covenant, it's not predicated on the obedience of God's people anymore. It's predicated on the obedience of Jesus himself. So every law that Moses has given and then wrote down, Jesus obeys it perfectly. More than that, Jesus throughout his ministry led people, how? By prioritizing them and also cultivating habits of humility that were rooted in these deep convictions that he had that God was wanting to restore us to his presence. And then the craziest thing happens. At the end of Jesus' life, there is no massive retirement party like Mr. Holland had. There's no celebration. There's no thank you, there's no honor for him. Instead, he's taken, he's beaten, he's mocked, he's cursed, he's nailed to a tree, he's forced to breathe his last breaths alone, afraid, humiliated, enslaved to the point of death. And the giant question is, why? How does that give Paul any confidence? How does that sustain what we need to be sustained as a great leader? Because through those events, Jesus was leading his people into freedom and flourishing. You see, something they could never earn on their own, Jesus was earning on their behalf. He gives his life so that we might be brought back into the presence of God under his leadership and granting us access to his freedom from sin and freedom to to the ultimate flourishing that we're always looking for now and forever. Jesus allows himself to become enslaved to the point of death that we might taste this freedom that God has for us. He trades places with us. And this is how Christ leads his people. And the more beautiful and captivating, friends, that that becomes to us, the more it will shape how we lead those other people in our life that God's called us to. So where do we go from here, quickly? Let me make just a few comments. Let's go back to our original question. What does it mean to be a great leader? Listen, great leaders prioritize people. They cultivate habits of humility in their life, and they have deep, 
deep convictions. Not all great leaders are Christians. Hear me for a second. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Not all great leaders are Christians. However, all great Christians somewhere are borrowing a lot of Christian theology to be a great leader. At the same time, Christians ought to be great leaders. Why? Because we serve and are united with the greatest leader of all, God himself through Christ. So about you personally, let's, I mean, what about you personally? Hey, all of us in this room have some kind of leadership capacity in the spaces in which we operate Monday through Sunday. You do. I do. Again, the capacity, the size of it is, is, is irrelevant because all leadership is, is only different by degree, not by kind. So whether you're leading a person or two people or two million, God expects you and I to acquire the heart of a great leader, being people-focused and Christ-centered. So of those three things, here's where I'm gonna leave you. Look, proof. Of those three things, prioritizing people, cultivating habits of humility, and fervently having convictions related to the gospel, of those three things, which are you weakest in? Well, let me ask you a different way. Which of those areas do you want to strengthen? Just be honest with yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. This is rhetorical. Which of those areas? Now, here's the good news. Guess what? When you go to work tomorrow, whether that be in the home, whether that be at a coffee shop, whether it be, at, I don't know, wherever you go to work or whatever interactions you have with people tomorrow, guess what? you get to practice. And when you fail, know this, Christ did not fail. And he looks at you and he says, my righteousness I'm giving to you. You didn't earn it. You don't really deserve it, but I'm crazy about you. And then he says this, get up, Tuesday morning, let's try again. And I'll be with you the whole time. Lead well. Be people. Let's be people who are people-centered and Christ-focused. Would you pray with me? Lord, it is a tall order to be the kind of leader that you are calling us to be. But the good news is this. We're not even sufficient enough to do it anyways, but you are, and your spirit is. So, Father, would you give us grace would you give us a desire to lead those you put in, our, put in our life the way that you have led us? Might your gospel be so beautiful to us today and tomorrow. And Father, might we participate in what you're doing in the world around us for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.